Hello everyone, uh, my name is Noé Mandel, Director of Scottish Documentary Institute, and it's with great pleasure that today we've got Margaret Olin all the way from Norway with us. And as we were chatting early on, Margaret, we've been trying to invite you to uh, Scotland for many, many years now. Um, you've got a, a great kind of base of funds, kind of, you know, looking at your work regularly. Every time one of your films come out, you know, we make a point of showing it. So it's fantastic to be able to, to welcome you and to be able to have a conversation with you about your amazing kind of you know, craft um, and your insight as a filmmaker. So, Margaret, um, tell us a little bit about how did you become a documentary filmmaker? Yeah, um, we have to go way back then. I grew up on the west coast of Norway together with my sister, my mother and father. And I think I was around seven years old when I decided to become a storyteller. It started there. And for me, like learning to read, and write sentences and having this feeling that what I have written on a piece of paper that that would stay in the world forever sort of that I have seen something and I could write it down and here it was. And my mother was my first audience. So when I grew older, uh, I continued to write things. And when she came home from work, I read it to her and I wanted, <laughs> I, I was like, if, if I could make her to cry, then that saved my day. <laughs> so at an early age, I really wanted to express emotions. And um, so I grew up thinking that I, I was supposed to be an author or a journalist because in the village where I grew up, nobody thought that making films was something that you could make a living out of, you know. So. But then I, uh, after high school, I attended university. We didn't have a national film school at the time in Norway. So I had to uh, pick different courses and uh, degrees to, um, yeah, to get uh, uh, theoretical um, insight into film and then uh, a three year practical education at a college in very close to where I grew up. Volda, it is called. Um, so for my generation, people that stayed in Norway and got their education, they went to Volda. And that was three year and like an in-depth uh, education in documentary filmmaking. And that was the feeling of coming home, uh, expressing what I saw and always searching for what it is to be a human being in our time and that film was even better than writing those sentences so yeah so i have stayed in the field and why documentary um i, I also since i was a little child i've been very like engaged in the society i was the kind of child that was very uh, yeah, my parents and my grandmother was, they were watching, watching the news and I, we saw, yeah, people having difficult times or hunger and I, I could go to my room and lock the door and, and cry and my mother had to come and explain to me that um, they couldn't do anything, but I said that 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 ain't true, if everyone thinks like that, nothing will happen, we have to do something. So I think that at a very early age, I thought that um, I had to find a tool, not only to express what I saw, but that everyone's voice counts, sort of. And my voice counts too. And I really believe that for me, film is the language of emotions. And, you know, we have, um, science and scientists and we have the reports and the facts and all that is crucial and it's so important that our society is built on that but at the same time uh, artists that know how to express what it is to be a human being and express feelings uh, together we can achieve more um, and that is my experience also when i go into different poli um, 
fields in politics. Uh, most of my films is about social political is issues that when I am debating with uh, the politicians in Norway, if we debate school, they talk, talk about figures and statistics. And I talk, talk about um, the children. I talk about childhood, what it is to be a child. What's your need? What's your longing? What it is to be seen? And it's not, mm, or it's easy to understand that they, um, not that they have their interest, but all their time are like occupied on what they have to answer for in the media and uh, all the questions that they have to answer or all the time. So they can't like um, have all the languages. But um, I believe that art and, and filmmaking and books and paintings and music is essential mm, in a society as, as, a, as a whole or where we're heading, that our, our voice is essential, yeah. I mean, your first international big hit was the film My Body, which was a very, very personal film mm -hmm. at a time when we didn't see so many kind of no personal films. I mean, that, that need of working through the emotion, but also details of one's life. I mean, wh where this, does this need come from? Yeah, um, that film was, um, uh, for me, it was an important film to make at at a personal level as well that I I had all this uh, when I grew up all these comments of my body it it is like this it should have been like that <laughs> can you fix it and this was way before we started to do all this surgery to fix our bodies you know uh, and when I became 30 I thought that it's time to leave all this behind this is me take it or leave it <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to do any surgery. I'm, I, uh, I've had a, uh, I've had my boyfriends, you know, and my lovers, and uh, I, it, it was, it was important to make it, and and I, I also believe that at a deeper level, when you spend two, three years making a film, you don't necessarily. Um, immediately understand why you're making the film. You want to contribute to a debate in society. And this was my generation kind of being a feminist, not the big political um, fights out there, but it has to do with um, how we see ourselves. So, you know, I could have picked my sister or a girl I knew or a friend and made a film about her body. But this was, um, um, I have been thinking a lot of times that maybe I should have done this film while I went to school, but then the Norwegian authority, not authorities, but the Norwegian public would have been spared to see, to see the film of my body. Uh, I thought that already making it, but you know, as a docu documentary filmmaker, you go into very close to people, inside their families and inside them to as express their experiences. And by doing this uh, with myself, I also uh, learned how it is to be exposed in the public, uh, not only to like uh, being exposed as the filmmaker behind the film, but also being the object it was my body uh, on the screen and um, that was a good experience and so when i uh, when i'm mentoring uh, young students uh, during education a lot of people come to me make uh, ask me about their films and if they are supposed to choose behind some different projects i always say do a very personal film because you get to know so much that will help you in your filmmaking while you expose other people and their inner secrets and 
we are going to talk about self-portrait. And I think that the fact that Lena had seen my body, the film My Body, was essential for her to trust me. Mm. Yeah. And I mean, we'll talk a bit more kind of later about it, but uh, um, also how a filmmaker, documentary filmmaker, needs to set their own boundaries for ethics. Um, and by, uh, I'm assuming, making a, a film like My Body, it, it meant that you were setting up kind of, you know, that boundary where how far you are prepared to push yourself in terms of ethics and what's acceptable, not acceptable. Um, so, yeah, I'm sure, I mean, this film is really important in relation to self-portrait. But before that, I mean, you're talking about, uh, um, you know, being a feminist. Tell us a little bit about how it's like being a female director in Norway. Yeah, it's great. <laughs> I think it's great being a woman, uh, for a starter. Um, I got my first child when I was a film student and I was 21. I didn't plan for that, but that happened. And when I was pregnant, then I did plan for it. Um, but all my teachers were men. So I went up to their offices and I said that uh, I'm going to give birth around when we have the exam. And um, so uh, I, I still want to do all the exams. So you need to help me to like, um, uh, get through and I had my exams when Maria was uh, three weeks and did my best tests ever and <laughs> it was um, you know I she started in kindergarten when she was five so I when she was a baby I brought her some days I stayed at home of course but I brought her to school I carried her on my body on my body <laughs> and I um, uh, I have always been thinking that if doors are closed because you're a woman or because you're young or because you have a child then you need to open the door because no one will do that for you you have to ask for it and if they say no you have to make it happen and I didn't even just have a child. I also had a horse. <laughs> I started to ride horses when I was 10. And Fidel, he was a white Ar Arab horse. And I worked for him for seven years. And then he became mine because my parents couldn't afford to buy me a horse. Uh, and I had this horse for 29 years. So he followed me until I was almost 40. And besides my two, two daughters, I think that having this horse is the biggest gift I have been given in my life. But, you know, being a student, having um, not having so much money, having a horse and a child. And so how it is to be a, f a woman and a filmmaker, it, it's more for me that how it is to be Margaret and be a filmmaker that but this having a child at an early age that uh, sort of led to that I wanted to work much from home, made most of my film from Norway, uh, staying at home, spending time with my child. Uh, so I had to be my own boss, making my own production company. And for the last 10 years, I've also been producing my own films and taught me the skills of being a producer that also benefits me as a filmmaker. I own my own film. So yeah. Um, if you want, if you know what you want to do, um, just do it. Mm. So, Absolutely. and I have never experienced if I really want to make a film that I'm going to make this film that I haven't been able to finance it. Uh, my first boyfriend, he, when we, he's the father of Maria, my um, oldest daughter, and, and uh, we were quite poor students <laughs> and we were like oh, how do we have how can we afford to pay the bills and he said there is a lot of money out there so when we need it <laughs> we're we're going to get some and I said we can't do bank robbery what are we going to do and he said we're going to develop the skills to get the money so that was a pretty good advice from him 
Indeed, and it worked out pretty well for you. <laughs> yes, <laughs> yes. <laughs> Great. So um, we're going to talk about self-portrait. And uh, I think, you know, just before we start diving into what is a very emotional conversation, uh, let's have a look at the trailer. When I was little, so I wanted that I could stop the time because I didn't speak so fast. I didn't want to be a child, I didn't want to be a child. But when I started to take a photograph, I found out that I can stop the time with the picture. And it's like that that makes me so engaged. It's that you can freeze the time. som säger att att leva är att göra sig själv sårbar. Det är väldigt fint bild på den sjukdomen min för när du inte spiser så skruvar av känslor. Följer läka så ska det gå an att jag känner mig bubbert att känna mig sjutton år, som det är väldigt rart ut. Men då måste kroppen få nok näring över tid. Jag har ju varit död när många gånger och det är en form för sakta självmord egentligen. Men nå, det siste året, så har jeg tenkt sånn, uff, jeg må bli freskere, for fanken tenker om jeg dør, jeg har jo så masse jeg skal gjøre med de bildene mine. Mitt store prosjekt er egen utstyring med kjøreprosesser, så jeg har veldig mye jobb, og den skal du smelle ta. She is an amazing talent. One of the greatest talent. Maybe the greatest talent I've ever seen. Skammer du deg, du da? Stolt. Modig. Kind of, you know, Margaret. How did you come across um, Merlin? I mean, what? How? Yes. I mean, how, how did you decide to make such a film? Yeah. Um, Espen Valin. Uh, we are three directors of uh, this film, and Espen Valin. Uh, he is a still photographer, uh, but also shooting on on video, and he came to me. Uh, he had been following Lena for uh, two, three years, um, and he needed a director and a producer. He had went. He had already been to the national broadcasters in Norway, but they said no. They did not want to come on board on this project. Uh, and um, but he was, he was convinced that. Um, Lena, her story, her ability to tell uh, about her experiences and also her art, that that was um, something that uh, we could make a film out of. So we set up a meeting and I met Espen at immediately I felt that he was the person that I could trust. And that is crucial, of course, if you want to go into such a project like this. And um, so he showed me some of the material that he had uh, been collecting and he showed me some of the images, uh, photographs of, of Lena. Uh, and I remember going home from that meeting and I was crying. Uh, and that was um, her art. Um, I really felt her bravery, her courage, um, that she, um, the way that she uses light, uh, how she composes uh, an, an image, that everything was there. Um, so I set up a meeting with Lena. Uh, we met just the two of us 
And as I said before, she had seen my films and she really wanted me. She had asked Espen to, yeah, um, try to get me on board. Mm -hmm. So the trust was there um, as we sat down at the first meeting. And I remember Lena saying that I don't feel that I have to express myself for you to understand who I am. And I felt that that was true. And you know, uh, at the time I was in the editing of a, another film called Childhood. And my boyfriend had just had a big stroke, a brain stroke. So the situation at home was very uh, difficult. Um, and if you see, or when I look into the situation of Lena, and I knew that it was going to be hard and all these ethical questions, I should maybe have said, no, it's not the time for me, but I couldn't. It was like uh, I was uh, <laughs> hit by lightning or something, seeing her art. Uh, but then I, um, went to Katya. I was producing a film that Katya directed at the moment about uh, psychic uh, ill inmates and how we treat them in uh, prison in Norway, uh, the use of uh, isolation. And um, uh, so we had been discussing uh, ethical questions in depth during many months. Uh, all these things that we had to take into consideration with all the inmates that we tried to portray in this film. And Katya is the same age as Lena, and Katya is highly talented. And I, and when you're a young filmmaker, it can be hard to get your next project financed. But if she came on board, I knew that uh, we could develop something together. So Espen continue as one of three photographers of the film. And it was also um, the fact that Katya came on board was um, crucial for me because of the situation at home, you know. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah. So how did you work? I mean, three co-directors. I mean, it's mm -hmm. quite a lot to communicate, especially in such a um, fragile situation. Yeah. Um, since I also I'm the producer of the film. I was the one um, that stayed most in contact with Lena and her parents. Uh, it was important they, they wanted to be a part of the film because Lena was, uh, was living at home with her mother mm -hmm. and uh, they were in this or the so important part of her life. Um, and I think that when you are um, three different directors it's not that we are supposed to do the same <laughs> but do what we can do best and Espen already had this intimate relationship with Lena uh, over many years so he could still film Lena in situation where it were only the two of them. Uh, Katja was the one that went out when we uh, wanted to follow Lena when things were happening happening around her like the exhibition or uh, that she that when Lena was working to to take more uh, photos for example well I was the one that do the in-depth interview with Lena and uh, with the parents and also when she was hospitalized by force. Uh, and it's, it's even hard, you know, to ask uh, the, the health team around Lena to be able to be there uh, to film at such a point. But I've, I have a lot of experience now and uh, that you have that kind of trust because people know what you have been doing before. And of course, it was so important that Lena wanted us to be there and the parents wanted us to be there um, and be able to make that happen and then be the one to have uh, the dialogue on different levels to be able to 
stay with Lena during these difficult times. So mm. Mm, then as a producer, it's, it's my task, it's my, um, yeah, that, that I really try to, what, what is the best that Katja can bring to the table and Espen can bring to the table and what can I bring to the table and together and also with our editors, Helge and Misha and the um, musician Susanne Sundford, it's it's a work of several artists, I think. Mm. And I mean, Lena is an amazing artist. I mean, uh, uh, outstanding kind of photographer, as we you know saw in the film. Um, how do you think that kind of you know her own kind of creativity influenced your creativity during the making of this film? Hmm. Mm. In many levels, I think, uh, we uh, had many discussions with Lena uh, about art. Uh, and if I speak for myself then, that um, I really felt that the way she uh, present herself, you know, she says, I think, treat times in the film that she doesn't want to be seen as ill. Um, she wanted to be seen as Lena Maria, the person behind the illness. And that is what we try to do with the film, that we, we see through the diagnosis and how other uh, people uh, or the doctors um, define her. She wanted to define herself. And she, she does this with uh, so much courage, it's so honest, it's it's raw, it's kind of brutal, and it's beauty. It's not pretty, it's not nice, but it's it's beautiful. Mm -hmm. And many people will say that uh, images of a person that is anorectic can never be beautiful. It can, but it's different from being pretty. Mm -hmm. It's, it's, um, and for me, that has to do with her ability to undress the illness, expose the illness, see through it, um, and express the feelings that was problematic for her to deal with in her life that was what caused the, the illness. And in her photos, she expressed this as a ballerina, um, that every detail, you know, the way she holds her fingers and her toes, it's in every detail, she is, she's present. And that way of commit to your work, uh, I think she she she's an she's the best. <laughs> she for me she, she she isn't here anymore. But she was the best photographer alive in Norway when we made this film, and she's a master of her art, and that forced us to do our best too, you know. And that I really felt when I discussed with Lena that when the film is going to be launched there will be some criticism that we shouldn't make this film. It can be a trigger for those that have the disease. And of course, that is obvious, but I felt that together we could be rock solid. We knew why we were making the film. Um, and the fact that it was so important for her and you know, the ethics, uh, the discussion we have, we had um, when making this film um, at two, two different times, I was very close to stop, stop the process and close down the project. But that had never to do with Lena and her parents because they always wanted us to continue. But I had to step back uh, to have a pause like that we really felt that it was 
in her best interest that we continued. And I think that one of the most uh, um, uh, important things that we decided, and it is, it has to be this way, but you, you really have to think it through. What does it really mean? But the fact that we were filming her should never interfere in treatment. Mm. Yeah, so that meant that for several months we couldn't film at all. Um, the fact that she was so ill uh, meant that I, I had to have a discussion with my fi financiers that maybe the film, it m might not be finished. Mm. Because if I, had, I at some point had felt that it wasn't good for Lena that we continued, I wouldn't have done it. Um, the consultant at the Norwegian Film Institute, uh, a Danish woman, Helle Hansen, she was fantastic. And I could really, uh, we had several meetings and I could share with her all these difficult ethical questions. Um, because as a producer and filmmaker, you, uh, it's, very important what Lena and the people around her, the team of doctors and um, and uh, the parents, what they think. But the I have to uh, uh, as I have the responsibility um, also towards the audience. Um, and. Um, I have a Swedish mentor, Stefan Jarl. Uh, he has made beautiful and strong and fantastic documentaries um, for decades. And he once told me that um, a documentary film will never be better than the relationship it um, it um, and um, it rests on. Can you say that yeah. that um, the quality of the trust, the quality of the access, the time spent, uh, the quality of the relationship, when the audience meet your film, they will feel it. So if you ask them to sit on the bedside of Lena after she has tried to commit suicide. They, from the first tone of the film to the last image, they have to feel that you hold them in the hand, sort of. And that is really my experience with all my filmmaking is, uh, um, yeah, the quality of the, the relationship that a film is built upon. I mean, I guess um, already in the photography of Lina Marie, I mean, we, we, we get that deep feeling that uh, she's using that as a uh, therapeutic tool, really, as, you know, I mean, she's an artist, but she also needs kind of, you know, her art to, to keep going. Um, I mean, what did you feel that the film would be able to you know, to also be used as a healing tool for her, for people watching it? I mean, how did you place yourself in relation to what she was trying to do with her photography? Yeah. Mm. Uh, I have, I wrote down something that she said. Uh, she said, um, she said, my photographs are not anorectic, anorectic images. They go far beyond that. They show human pain and suffering, sorrow, something we all can recognize whether we are sick or not. But is, in this pain is also hope, courage and strength. Um, Lena had the ability when she met the refugees um, on the beach in Lesbos, 
to see the playfulness of the children, even though they were, they were in this difficult situation. She could like see through the mask and see the soul of people. And even though she had this body um, that had that suffered so much and were so thin that it, it was she was so tiny. But inside she wasn't tiny at all. She had she was <laughs> she wanted everything. Mm. Susanne Sunfer, uh, she has a song uh, undercover. I wish I had a lover. <laughs> and Leanne uh, loved that song. Um, she, she wanted everything that every one of us wants. And um, I think that when you have an illness that is so severe and so uh, visual like anorexia that people see you only as that and for her she had, she wanted to tear apart and confront the illness but she wanted us to see who she really was and uh, the film was launched in Norway January uh, last year and before the corona closed down our cinemas, uh, we were able to travel with the film for two months. And many, many people saw it at the cinemas in Norway. Mm. And many young people that has been suffering from anorexia, their parents and teachers and uh, people also very close to it came to me after the screenings and they were very thankful and moved and the young girls said, thank you for making this. Mm. I have not been that ill, um, but I feel so familiar with her. And there are so much that could have been my life too. But seeing this film also scares me because once you have had anorexia, it's like drug addiction that you, it's always there behind you as a ghost that you feel that at some point if I lose my boyfriend or if something happens that I might go into the same behavior again. But many of these young girls told me that uh, this scares the hell out of me. I'm not going even close. I, I'm going to have people <laughs> around me when it's go because we know life does us, life is difficult and it will come my way and everyone's way. But when that happened, I have to be surrounded by people that can really help me to not go where Lena had to go and that ended her life. And the first meeting with Lena, that was exactly what she said. All this suffering, Margaret, I really need to know that it has been it hasn't been for nothing. And I, you know, the film has been <laughs> winning so many awards and it still does. And for everything the film achieves or the emails that I get from, from people that sees it, I should so much want her to be here so I could send that to her. Um, because what she really wanted to happen. I think for many people the film does exactly that. And that hasn't has not to do with our skills of being filmmakers uh, first and foremost. It has to do with her. How very precise she is when telling us what this illness is all about. Um, and, and when she does, I think many people has to really, they meet themselves, they have to go through what they have been thinking about, they thought they knew about anorexia, and it is completely different. And she have 
this um, yeah, she, she's very gifted as a photographer, but she is, she is also gifted to, to speak about her experiences. Mm -hmm. So that is why she's, she's brilliant as a main character for a film. I mean, certainly both kind of Lena and, and the film kind of, uh, um, you know, challenge my way of thinking about anorexia because I always felt that it was about being out of control and yet every image that uh, Lena takes uh, and the way you kind of reproduce that also in the film is about control. I mean, she's so precise in her photography, so in control of understanding who she is, what she's doing, how she's doing. I mean, for me, that was a really kind of in you know, a big challenge, kind of, you know, getting my head and my emotions around it while watching the film. How did you feel about, as a filmmaker, I mean, how did you cope with that strong sense of control and yet, you know, still not being able to, uh, you know, to, to pull life, really? Mm. Yeah. Yeah, she says in the film that um, life is so beautiful, uh, but why is it so difficult to let life unfold as it is? Um, and for many people, uh, being an artist, um, you might be, not everyone, but kind of fragile, <laughs> um, having um, all your senses very opened, uh, very open, and um, that things that you experience in life uh, set these deep prints, marks in you. And, and also when you, you're a child that you are maybe more frightened than other because you take in all these uh, big <laughs> cosmic <laughs> questions. Where, why, am, why am I here? Where do we come from? Where are we going? What will happen if my mother dies? Uh, um, and uh, when you grow up, you find that as an artist, these uh, or this is your greatest tools as a filmmaker or a musician or a writer. But as a child, it can be very hard. And Lena didn't grow out of it. She had us this as uh, her way of being and uh, that made her it's not a suffering that makes her a great artist it's what i have tried to explain now that's made her into a great artist her um, that sh she had this um, you know that to, to live strongly and feel strongly is different. She felt very strongly, but she managed and she was able to express it. So you can have, have uh, you can be a person that feel very strongly, uh, but you, ha you haven't a gift to express it. And then you might not be an artist, uh, but she was and um, so, in one way, she is, she has, uh, she goes into the world as a child, very curious, very open. Um, at the same time, she has, she suffers from a disease that is very controlling in every detail of her life. She didn't take any food. She just had these uh, nutrition drinks. And that was one ethical uh, question that we dealt with, that it was never ever something that I uh, wanted to do to challenge her. For example, asking her that when you have your meal, that we are going to film you. That wouldn't be possible for her. 
and if I had moved into that, like uh, the um, the control that she had to go through to uh, be friend with the disease, that that has that's the doctor's area. It's not mine, you know. So we never challenge that part of her. Um, but that was a different. That is something that follows the disease, but she being in control of the expression when she was working as a photographer, that was something different. That, that for me, that had nothing to do with, uh, with the control regime that she was uh, living under at all. Um, Did you actually so have those discussions with her about what was okay to film, what wasn't okay to film. I mean, what, how did you kind of define those boundaries? Yes, of course. I discussed that at a very early stage with Lena. Um, and as I said before, it has to do with trust that I said that we have to be completely transparent and everything that comes up along the way, tell me, we have to discuss. Uh, and I also discussed this with um, Norway's most uh, uh, experienced psychiatrist, uh, psychiatrist on um, anorexia um, to, to know where we were not supposed to go and what we should not challenge. Uh, because have, if we had done that, that might have led to that uh, the illness would develop, you know. Uh, so that was, uh, yeah, very important. And I also discussed that with her parents and, of course, me and Lena. We talked a lot during the three years that uh, from I came from I came on board until she died uh, on October the twenty second in. 2019. I mean, all directors have uh, a duty of care of uh, their characters. I mean, we need to be more responsible about them than often they are about themselves. But you also, as a producer, you also need to look after your crew, yourself. I mean, in, in that kind of context, mm -hmm. how did you manage to keep going filming what is just kind of extreme pain in someone and i mean how did you yeah how did you do it mm. yeah i think that we we discussed uh yeah we discussed with uh, lena and her parents uh but the three of us discussed much on the phone, but also when we met and before a new shooting and after sh the shooting. But I think that this, what we experienced making this film is quite extreme. I have been doing documentary films for 25 years and you can never prepare for this. And uh, I think that Espen and Katya and me, we are, um, now we only meet, it's Corona times, and if not, I, I think we would have sat down more <laughs> after the film was uh, launched. And uh, yeah, you know, Lena died in October. And even if we, we stopped shooting uh, in the summer and we edited the film, so it, we have started to edit, edit in January. 2019 and she saw the film in the summer with her parents to say uh, if there was anything that she wanted us to uh, not reveal or something but uh, the only thing that she loved the film but she said that there is one scene I'm that I miss and that was the scene with the priest and <laughs> so we we did take that in uh, but it was important that she saw the film and that it was okay for her. And then before she died, she asked me, uh, we knew that she was going to die. And then she asked me if we could keep the plan. And the plan was for the film to be released 
on the 17th of January in Norway. And it had a lot of festivals internationally coming along. And I asked the parents what they thought. And they said, if that is her wish, it's our wish too. Because I think that Lena was afraid that if we shut down um, uh, and maybe waited six, seven, eight months, um, she was afraid that it was not going to happen. You know, this is the moment. You just go as I'm still here. I'm going to follow you. <laughs> you just go through. And I promised her that. And then when we met early in January to do start doing the interviews. Um, uh, it was very, very hard. And it was very hard to travel with the film as well because um, we grew very close and even now it's hard. I have been filming people before that has died during shoot and after shoot, but they were like in an age that 95 or yeah, you have prepared that they can die, you know? And all the way, I felt the breath of death so very close during the time that I knew Lena, but still you're not um, prepared that someone that is 33 and have the same longings that my daughters that are so gifted and so excited about everything that happened to her art that she's just supposed to say goodbye. So, and the last months we had stopped filming, uh, but we were follow, following her very closely up until she died. Um, and we had all these conversations about death that they're not included in the film and it has nothing to do with the film, because it's not a film about death. It's a film about embracing life and her struggle to be here. So, um, But did you find that uh, death affected the shape of the film or the content of the film? What did you say? But did you find, I mean, the fact that, I mean, you, you knew she was dying towards the end and the fact that she did die eventually, I mean, has that kind of affected uh, the structure of the film or the content of the film? I mean, you know, did you have to change kind of the course of what you wanted to make out of that film? Yes. As I, uh, uh, mm. At, at the early stage when financing it, we thought that we were making a film about a girl that uh, should succeed in, um, yeah, be able to stay here and uh, work as an artist. But um, a year before she died, um, she told me that uh, when she got the injury in the neck uh, and nobody could help her, you know, because um, the underweight that she was in, one thing is that the organs suffers, but she almost had none. She didn't have muscles at all. She, she had some, of course, but when, but when she got this injury, if somebody were to adjust her spine or her neck, she didn't have the muscle to, to keep that um, in place. Yeah. So nobody could really help her after the car crash and where she got this in injury. And after months, uh, the pains grew harder and it was hard for her to keep a camera and to work and she got hospitalized and after a while by force. And then I started to see that she was always speaking about that she hoped to be an old woman. But then I knew she was not going to be that. So, of course, when we started to edit, uh, I already knew that. 
so I think that uh, the rhythm of the film, it's a kind of meditative. Mm -hmm. It is, um, uh, it has the pace of her. You know, she, she looked like 12 the first time I met her. She had not gone through puberty. She looked like a child. She was wise as a grown-up, fully-bred artist. But her body was like a 95-year-old woman. And all this mixed together, she had the spirit of... She had this deep spirit, uh, being a child and being old, but she had the, the, the tempo <laughs> of an old woman. Uh, so when she uh, went to people that she wanted to portray, take their photos, even if, if it was children or old people in kiosks, she went, she had energy, but she, she was like, attending them in a very careful and respectful way. And the way Lena approached people and the way she was, I, we, we tried to let that be the, the rhythm and the flow of the film as well. And she was very attracted to older women. I mean, we, we see that, you know, especially in kiosk, you know, where she seems to favor spending time with her, uh, with old women. Mm. What was that relationship between her and old age? Do you think it was, uh, I mean, was she fascinated by old people or did she feel that she was in the right place with them? Yeah, I think it has to do with her being an old soul, sort of, that lived life, that yeah, it's from a song of Susanna Sun for Life Does Us, that she was interested in people that have been living their lives and see their stories, their um, challenges, who they were a long time ago in their eyes, in their like expression. Um, she loved children too, but uh, maybe unconscious that she knew, I know that she knew that she was not going to live until she became as old as her grandmother, even if she says so. Mm. So maybe that had something to do with her being uh, attracted to old people, but also the calmness, the, uh, the knowledge that she felt that she was one of them, sort of. It felt safe for her to, she, she had a body that was very marked, even though it was so young, the same as them, like, we have the same body, look at me, look at you, the skin is almost the same, the wrinkles, the, the hair, it's, uh, yeah, I, I believe that she, even though she in the film says that, I hope I will get married. <laughs> and she did that. She she hoped for that, of course. Yeah, dreams. Yeah. yeah. So that and again, I mean, as a filmmaker, you, you know, you manage to kind of create that uh, pacing and that sense of calm and quietness. I, I mean, there's the, on one hand like this silent scream of pain throughout the film, but at the same time, there is a, a real you know, we feel actually safe kind of, you know, on the journey that you take us. Um, and, and music has been really important in, uh, in the film, which is different from other films, your previous films. Um, mm -hmm. I mean, tell us how to use music in, in a film which is already so emotional without becoming manipulative. Yeah. Um... The story behind the music in this film, it's, uh, <laughs> it's not uh, what it normally is, because what happened here was that Lena met Susanne Sundfer, and Susanne, uh, before she came on board as the composer of the film, or the score, um, they met and they uh, became uh, friends. Mm. 
uh, and Danny, I have been listening to Susanne for years. She is, uh, besides uh, Morten Harket in Aha, I think she has the greatest voice in Norway and she's fantastic. And um, mm, so it was, if you say that Susanna in her field is the best we have and Lena in her field is the best we have, it was a meeting between masters. And when I saw them together and they really understood each other. Mm. Uh, so I asked Susanna, she said yes to do the score and we met and uh, we just talked about Lena. I talked about how I see Lena and not so much about the film, but Lena. And she talked about Lena. And then she had this freedom to, we sent her some of the, uh, the footage uh, just to see it and see the pace of it. And then she had the freedom to, to find her angle or her take on it. Um, we didn't have an agreement that she was to write lyrics and a song for Len Maria, When the Lord. So if people listening to this, if you haven't heard the song, it's on Spotify, Susanne Sundford, When the Lord, and the ly lyrics is written to Len and it's, it's fantastic. Um, so I felt that together, that as I said in the beginning, uh, that this film is Lena is an artist, we are three directors and we had um, besides Espen two photographers that are very good in their own way. We have two editors and we have Susanne Sundford and together we all really felt, uh, I think, um, I, I think we felt like grateful that it became our task to take care of her story and her art for previous or others that wasn't able to meet her. Um, and that everyone gave their best effort in, into it. It felt like that. And I, for me, Susanna, uh, her work, it's so far from being sentimental. It, and the same with Lena that some people said at one point that they were afraid that we were uh, uh, romantizing the illness. It has nothing to do with that for me at all. It, it is, uh, it's art, it's, in a, it's on a different level. It's, it, it's honest. Mm. It, it's brutal and it's honest and there is a purpose behind so then I, I'm not afraid of those things like being sentimental or being too much or it just felt that what everyone had to put on the table it made yeah make us come closer to who Lena was and the understanding of this devastating disorder. It is really quite an achievement that this tiny little woman managed to bring so many great artists together and, and, and celebrate life, really. It's so uh, fantastic. Yeah. I'm aware I've been monopolizing you, Margaret, and I would like to say to our audience that uh, you are very welcome to, uh, you know, to put questions on the chat box or, you know, just kind of, you know, wave and uh, speak up kind of, you know, any question you'd like to, to put to Margaret. I'm coming to the end of, uh, of my list, but I can go on talking to Margaret for much longer, that's for sure. So please don't be shy, just to um, add your questions to, to the chat and uh, we'll come to it. Uh, meanwhile, uh, Margaret, I mean, just kind of uh, on a more kind of, you know, practical basis, how easy or how difficult is it to uh, finance such a film? Hmm. We had 
the Norwegian Film Institute and NRK coming on board, and also uh, some organizations in Norway that work with mental illness. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, so we had a strong national back backing. And then we got uh, the sales agent Cinefil uh, with Filipa Kowarski on board. And uh, the film uh, opened the forum at IDFA uh, where Katya and I was pitching. Um, and uh, then Filippa came and said that I have to be the agent for this film. And we said yes. <laughs> and it was uh, amazing to work with her, uh, all the experience and that she really, uh, yeah, she really loved the project from day one. Um, and having a sales agent that believe in it strongly, it, it's so important. And then because of Philippa and the pitches that we did in uh, IDFA and uh, Copenhagen Docs and in Cannes, we managed to get Arte and BR in Germany on board and then we had the financing. So it took some time, but uh, we, uh, yeah. So it's not, I mean, it's not exactly a straightforward project to, to finance, really. I think broadcasters feel very shy at engaging with such films. Yeah. And you can say the smaller broadcasters, uh, we have sold the film to a lot of countries now, mm -hmm. but they wanted to see the film finished be mm -hmm. before they uh, decided. But... Uh, uh, broadcasters that have bought my films before, uh, then it was easier that they sort of trusted that I could manage to handle a, a topic and the, uh, yeah, like this. Yeah. I mean, in many ways, it is a cinematic uh, film. It's a film that needs to be seen on the, on the big screen, but also I think emotionally, it's so, um, you know, you need to give yourself over to the film in order to really be able to watch it. Um, so maybe broadcasters are kind of, you know, are, are kind of, you know, find it really hard to be able to place such a film on, on kind of the little box as opposed to the bigger box. Um, but in terms of um, festivals and audience, I mean, you, you said you kind of did a tour in, uh, in Norway, but I guess, I mean, with the pandemic, you, not, you haven't managed to kind of go very far with it, really. Mm. No, the, the film has been to a lot of festivals, but uh, it's like now that I'm not able to visit you. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't, because of Corona, been able to we managed to go to two or three festivals and then everything closed down. But the film is traveling and it has won a lot of awards internationally and it has been shortlisted to many awards. And um, so the renome of the film has been quite good and, um, and also audience from different countries reach out to us and some of the uh, awards that, it, or um, yeah, that it has been given is audience awards, so that is good. I like that. I like the audience awards. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> very gratifying. Kind of, you know, I, I have to confess, I was very disappointed that the film did not get nominated for the Oscars because I think it sits really well there amongst kind of you know, the, the finalists really so um, I'm, I'm sorry but uh, uh, you're not going to be there this weekend <laughs> yes. but, uh, yeah. but yeah. audience awards kind of you know is what you need and what you deserve kind of you know for this film mm. so maybe Alex let's have a look at what people been posting on the chat box um, yes we have uh comment and a question from Rohan uh, firstly saying that um, thank you he's thanking for the film a very powerful film with a great deal of emotional insight um, and is also asking about um, 
you know, you talked about the role my body played in establishing trust with Lena. Uh, can you talk a little more about how you established this bond, this trust further in the early stage of the production? Yes. Um, it's an important question how to go about that. Um, and all my films relies on this bond or trust. Um, for me, it has to do with being open, being open, meeting people that are going to uh, be in my films, um, being very straightforward, telling them what I, uh, why I, why I want to make the film. That is the most important, not what we are going to do, because it's a journey and you don't know beforehand. And not uh, before you start, you, you don't, you're not sure about the take of the film. It can, it will also develop. But why I want to make the film, uh, that has to do with me and my life and who I am and wh why I see something important uh, or why I, I get attracted to some things uh, more than others. And, and I am honest about that. Another thing that I always do is that, you, you know, I have this written contract with uh, the participants in the film. And it says, journalists don't have that, but I do. It says that they, uh, they are supposed to see the film in the editing and make their comments and that we discuss it and find solutions. Because for me, it is one of the most important thing while making documentaries is access. That I can follow a person or a milieu or what it is everywhere. And that we decide after in the editing if it's going to be a part of the film or not. But for me to be able to get this material, they have to feel certain that um, how it is going, yeah, that they can see it. Because I am the only one that can, at an early point, see that it is important to be with you in every aspect of your life. Uh, people can think that, no, why should you need that? Or, but in my head, I know how I can use it, how I can put it together, how I can make this magical space <laughs> if I have the access. But if I am not able to shoot things, then I don't have that possibility. So that is very important for me that I am very straight that, because I feel kind of certain that it, if I get the access, I will make a film that they can, um, they can stand there and be proud of it. And uh, even if it's going to be a storm, often with my film, it has been storms <laughs> when they have been launched, but uh, as long as it, is it honest and they feel that uh, they are seen. I have never experienced that people want to cut things out of the film when editing. So that is important. But of course, you can have a written contract, but um, the things that aren't written, uh, the trust between you is also as important. But it has to do with reveal who you are. Mm. Just be open, share of your own life. So and, they get to know you. I mean, I, I guess because of uh, um, the you know delicate situation involving the parents, through the process of editing was also important. Yes, of course. And they saw the film as well. And it's, uh, I could never have aired this film without uh, the approval of the parents and Lena, never. And yeah. if they haven't approved it, I would have worked with it until they could, of course. Yeah. Alex? We have a question from Megan, uh, who is asking if you could give us a bit more information about her background, if 
uh, about her childhood, if there is any specific trauma that occurred that perhaps triggered her disease? No, there isn't. Uh, if, there, if there was, it would have been in the film. But as far as we know, and she knows, and uh, what she has shared, and also talking to her parents over this time, there isn't like one specific trauma. It has to do with, as I'm talking about her personality and that at, uh, I haven't been talking so much about this, but at an early age when she was 10 and she got the disease um, and she went into treatment and she was hospitalized, it was only or very much focus on the weight that she had, had to gain weight and if she wasn't able to it was she felt it was by force that Lena talks in the film about if they had been interested in what was behind the emotions that she hadn't been able to um, sort out uh, and at one point she get this uh, psychiatrist Hasse Linno and she was around 14 and then she was able to come back to school and stay in school and he was the first person then she had been ill sh since she was 10 and he was the fir first person that asks her uh, what do you need what do you want uh, that he was interested in her and uh, what was behind the disease and not only to gain weight you know um, and that is uh, such an important message because even today, uh, Lena also says in the film that this disease mm. frightens people. You know, when you your appearance is like hers, everyone thinks that is it possible for her to be alive at all? And the only thing the only thing that you can think of is that she, she has to eat and she has to eat because her heart can stop at any time. But it is like drug addiction that drugs has a function in one person's life, like starving has a function that you starve away the feeling. So if you are not going to starve yourself anymore, then you have to take care of the feelings, what's behind. And if you take away drugs from someone, then you have to replace what the function of the drug was with something else. So um, anorexia is the most deadly mental illness of all. And I hope that what Lenny is sharing with us can help us to understand more of it. Uh, yeah. Um, thank you. Uh, we have another question from Sana, uh, who is asking, did you find that being producer and director was empowering or did you have to make difficult decisions that created a conflict between creativity and the budget? Um. No, not conflict, uh, but uh, as um, life unfolds and with a film like this, that we saw that uh, we had to adjust the film to life as it happens, uh, we needed to hire the budget during the process to get more money. And I would have done that even if I wasn't uh, the director also. So. Uh, and that is the work of a documentary producer. I think that uh, uh, life becomes life comes before the film, and uh, we are filming what is happening with with people when it happens. So that means sometimes that you have to adjust, for example, the budget. So I, um, yeah. So we had to. I had to get more money and I did. Yes, thank you. I think this answers a bit the the next question also from Martina about how long did it take to make the film and if the budget was sufficient or did it become a challenge on the way? Mm. Yeah, 
uh, uh, Espen had been filming for two, two, three years, collecting material when he came to me. And when I came on board, it was three years before the film was launched. Mm -hmm. um, and that is approximate what it takes for me to make a film. It, it's three years from the ID to, to the cinema premiere often. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and I think the bu the budget was sufficient when we got the <laughs> when we got some more money when we had to adjust because she was hospitalized by force for, for one year. So uh, yeah, and I I see one of the questions when Lena was ten years old, and what was her childhood like? Uh, Lena's father was a uh, photographer, uh, but uh, not uh, as a hobby. Mm -hmm. uh, so he had been filming his family a lot. And he sent me a huge amount of tapes. Mm -hmm. And I went through all of them. Mm -hmm. uh, Christmas, birthdays, um, vacations, um, first school day for every year of Lena. Um, yeah she playing with uh, her father or her mother or and she had a very normal uh, childhood but you can see from an early age that she's very thoughtful she's a kind of dreamer and she's also very concerned about her own appearance in the world Interesting. <laughs> yeah. I have uh, another question from Justine asking, how hard was it to develop an audience for such a film about illness? Um, more thinking about the appetite for kind of happy or relieving escapist, escapist films that take audiences away from the pain of life. Yeah. Um. When you launch a film like this, it's very important to be honest towards your audience. As the poster for the film, we used one of Lena's own images. Mm, she has a dress, but you can see her skeleton under her skin and how thin she really is. That we didn't pick an image, her from behind, hiding what you were going to see. And this was also crucial and very important because this is not a film for everyone. People that are have the illness themselves should really consider thoroughly if they were going to see this film and maybe not see it at all. And saying when we la launch the film, it's not for everyone. That means that you might smaller your audience, but you you do not make a film like this to like to go for a box office hit. <laughs> uh, so, um, but we managed to get uh, almost 30,000 to see it at cinemas in Norway for one and a half month before the corona closed the cinemas. Um, and that has to do also us uh, working with different partners that people in Norway rely on um, organization that organizations that work with uh, uh, mental illness uh, to to provide information to work against uh, up against politicians and um, speak on behalf of uh, a part of the population uh, and um, uh, yeah. To be honest, to say what it is about, to um, Lena's parents and Lena herself before she died, she gave interviews. We went on national TV, both Lena and I, um, and her parents did too. And some people might think that this is not a film for me, but that is okay. That is really okay. So, uh, but a lot of people saw it too.
I'm sure the film will go on living for many, many years, Margaret. I mean, it's a, uh, uh, it's a legacy, really, not just a, not just a film. So um, it doesn't matter when people are going to see it. They will eventually kind of come to it, I'm sure. Yeah. Mm. I think we're coming to the end, Alex. No, no more questions. Uh, no more questions in the in the chat. Great. Thank you. Thank you ever so much, Margaret. Uh, I know it's a, a difficult film still to talk about, but also very important to to share kind of you know your experience in in the making of it. Um, but just before you go, I mean, you know, the, the good thing is you've actually moved on quite quickly onto a new project. How does it feel kind of shifting into the next adventure? Yeah. Hmm. Um, I, am, I am pitching my new film. It's called Songs of Earth uh, on Copenhagen Docks next week. Uh, and I'm in the midst of financing and uh, will try to get some um, co internationally co-producers um, on board. Uh, but I am filming nature. And for many years, because I grew up with uh, both on my father's side and my mother's side of the family, they have been farmers uh, as long as we know. And I talked about my horse uh, in the beginning. Uh, so being close to animals and nature, that has been a very essential part of my life. And with what is happening uh, with our environment and the milieu, it's important. And now after making the film about Lena, I really feel that I, I can't go into something um, that challenging uh, I need time to heal <laughs> um, it has been uh, um, for everyone losing her it's a big loss and uh, it's important to respect that those um, processes need time but going into nature crawling into one of Europe's biggest glaciers, Justralf Glacier, mm. uh, standing inside this blue ice cave. It's like putting your head up in a galaxy. It's so beautiful. You couldn't, <laughs> you can't imagine uh, seeing something like that, uh, like uh, this very old ice, you know. Uh, so I am exploring the nature of Norway. Um, nature is our home. The word ecology comes from oikos, that means home. Um, and the premise of the film is in the battle between power, man, and the powerful nature, the powerful winds. So it has to do about the bond between us and nature. Um, man's first love was nature. We must not forget our first love. So it's very, very nice to be up on the horse again. <laughs> <laughs> well, I'm delighted. That's a project that you're working on and I certainly look forward to uh, seeing it. So good luck with the pitching next week. Uh. And once again, Margaret, thank you very much and come back to Scotland. <laughs> yes, I will. <laughs> I will come one day when it opens up. I will come and thank you so much for Definitely. talking to me. Thank you. And thank you everyone for listening. Bye-bye. Uh, Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>